So to begin, I'd like all of you to take a moment to think about the sort of things that you do every day of your lives. What immediately comes to mind is basic things like waking up, going to work or school, getting dressed, eating, talking to friends, going to sleep. But there's another thing that we do every day as well, and that's consume information, consume information from media. And we don't really think about it explicitly. It's a passive thing that goes on. But you know, during the course of the day, when you wake up, your alarm clock goes off, and maybe the radio is on. You go downstairs, you pick up the newspaper, you read that. Or when you're on the bus to work or school, you scan through the metro or 24 hours. At school or work, we're talking with our friends. We're, going, we're having water cooler talk. We go home, the news is on. Throughout the entire day, we're checking our Twitter account, our Facebook page. There are links there about what's happening in the world. We check our email. Someone sent us a link. And I mention all of this because you might not do all these things in one day, but you do at least one of them. Information surrounds us all the time, and people are trying to get information to us. And people are trying to get information to us with a very specific reason and a message. And they're trying to engage you directly in a unique way. So my name's Justin McRoy, and I'm the coordinating editor of the UBC the student newspaper here at the University of British Columbia. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the media, audiences, how the two of them are interacting. And I'm going to talk about three main things. First, I'm going to talk about the new expectations for media with the technological revolutions that have happened. I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities and traps that this creates for media. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that we try and do to make the best of where we are today. And I'm going to do this through the lens of the UBC, your student paper, because it's what I know. Um, but because I have a few anecdotes that I think you'll enjoy and will illuminate some of the issues that the industry is facing. So the UBC is the student paper here. It began in 1918. Uh, and it began when students, all you know, the few hundred of them that were at this campus at the time, decided to give $2 each for a newspaper. But they didn't give $2 for a newspaper because they thought newspapers were the most wonderful thing in the world and would be forever and ever. It was because back then, if you wanted to get information what was going on in the world, it had to be from a newspaper. That was pretty much the only way you could find out what was going on. And then in 1995, students voted again to create an independent UBC. And they decided to give $5 each. And again, there were other ways of finding information, but a newspaper was still the most cost-effective way of finding it out. It made the most sense to do that. But now it's 2011, and we still put out a newspaper. But if a university was created today, and uh, people said, all right, we're going to create some sort of media group, what is it going to be? Well, there might be a newspaper or a print product around, but it would be seen that people would be giving money to a news organization. It would do a lot of different things. It would have a website, there would be videos, they would be extremely proficient in social media, because that's what the expectations are for people today with their media. You know, media is like anything else which is consumer-based. You might try it once or twice, but after that, if you're going to go there again, you're doing it because you have expectations of what you're going to get and people are going to deliver. You know, in 2009, for about two months, we didn't have comments working on our website. People were very upset that they could not type down what they wanted to say about our articles at the end. And they said, how could you do this? This is ridiculous. And we said, we know, we're sorry, our webmaster, we don't have one right now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you, you know, I, and, uh, but the fact is, they were right. Um, they were right, they had expectations, and we weren't following them. So you think about that, and you think about uh, that. I'm not going to get into this, well, the internet is changing journalism. Is journalism in a crisis? People talk about that from time to time. A lot of them are journalists, and they talk about it because their jobs are changing, and people don't like change in their jobs for the most part. Um, uh, but this change is good. It's leveled the playing field. You know, there's this anecdote that Jerry Seinfeld used to do in his stand-up bits, where he would say, isn't it interesting? On the New York Times, it says at the very top, all the news that's fit to print. And somehow, all the news in the entire world, each and every day, fits just to the end of the newspaper, to the final line. There's no more news. That's it. And of course, we know that's not the case. But for a long time, media was a curator. You had a certain amount of space in your paper or time in the program. And you chose the best stories. 
And that was it. And you put them out there. You were on top of your mountain, and you said to the masses, this is the news. And they took it. Well, now, of course, that's changed. We can get news from everywhere. Media is less of a curator and more of a helping hand, someone that guides you along the way, tells you this is the information that you need to know. Here are ways it can help you. Here are links to give you a little bit more context. And that's good. Competition is good in any, any industry. But with these changes have come a few challenges. And I'll name a few of them. First one is that now we know what people are reading. And that is terrifying. <laughs> because before, you could put out an article or a, a segment on video, assume it was good, assume that people watched it, and that would be the end of that. But now we know what people actually like to look at. And I'll give you some examples. And these are completely real. These are from the last year of the UBC, and they're the most popular things on our website, the most viewed things. So the most viewed news story, 2011. <laughs> there was a car that crashed into Blends. We had a picture of it. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people liked looking at it. Our most popular culture story of the year, did everyone remember when Shia LaBeouf was on campus a couple weeks ago? We put seven pictures of him online. Seven. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. That was the most popular culture story. The most popular sports story was one on StarCraft. We said it was a sport. <laughs> And then people put it on Reddit, and then people were very excited that someone called StarCraft a sport, and thousands of people went to see it. Our most popular video until three weeks ago was hundreds of students in their underwear running around campus and breaking into the hive dive late at night. But then a video that we did in September suddenly got picked up on the internet. It went viral. It went on College Humor. It went on e World. It went on Gizmodo. And now it's our most popular thing of all time. It has over 150,000 views, and it's this. It is engineers blowing things up. <laughs> and so you think about that. You go, well, on one hand, there's this journalism thing that I know is good and that I want to do. But on the other hand, dry ice and water, <laughs> celebrities, car crashes. So you have to always balance what you believe is right with what the audience wants. And it's not only the type of content, but the type of skew you give to it. You know, people talk about Fox News a lot and what that means for journalism, but ultimately they're successful because the audience has expectations and they deliver it time and time and time again in this certain way. And ultimately, you know, there's this anecdote that people go to news like a drunk goes to a lamppost. Not for illumination, but for support. <laughs> so you have that. And you also have this issue that uh, Dean Starkman of the Columbia Journalism Review calls uh, running in the hamster wheel. And he brings up a couple points. He says, number one, media is doing more than ever before. They're putting out more content. He uses the Wall Street Journal as an example. In 2000, they published 22,000 articles. In 2008, they published 38,000. So they're doing more and more, but they, like all organizations, are doing it with less. There's cutbacks everywhere. And so you're producing more with less journalists, so they're working more, they're working harder, but they're not fully sure what they're doing. And he says, the hamster wheel isn't speed, it's motion for motion's sake. It is a lack of discipline. It's news panic. It's an inability to say no. So whenever you see the Vancouver Sun has a slideshow of Megan Fox, that's the hamster wheel. Anytime you see an article in the Globe and Mail that says, will there be an election next month, and it's the seventh straight month you've seen that story, that's the hamster wheel. Every time you see some uh, reporter tweeting that a celebrity has died and they actually haven't died, that's the hamster wheel. And so there are these risks and these fears all over the place. And how do we cope with them? Well, at the UBC, we have a couple things that we try to do. Number one, we know what our audience is. It's students, it's people at the university. We can't change that, it's uh, who pays our bills, so it's very easy for us to define that and keep us disciplined. The second one is what sort of content do we provide? Well, we have little rule because everyone comes to us and says, hey, I've got this great story on this, or I've got this great story on that. And uh, we go, all right, well, 
Number one, is it about the university? Is it about a student? Is it about a faculty member? Is it about a staff member? Is it an event that someone's putting on? Is it an event here? If so, great, we can run it. Second question we ask is, okay, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with UBC. But are you, as a UBC student, able to bring some unique perspective to this event that otherwise wouldn't go filled in the media? Are we able to produce some additional value here? So when we have a UBC student who was in Bahrain during the Arab Spring, and she can talk about her experiences, that's a perfect example of how we can do stories that aren't about campus. And then the third question we ask is, are you Ernest Hemingway? Are you F. Scott Fitzgerald? No, you're not a fantastic writer, so you can't write about whatever you want. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, it's cruel, but it, uh, you know, you have uh, those rules in place and it gives you that discipline and it gives you the idea of, all right, here's our audience, here's our content. And then the third uh, part of that is constantly engaging and engaging in a variety of ways depending on our audience. So for example, we know our print product, people tell us that it competes in their minds with 24 or Metro, something that they just pick up at lunchtime when they have a few minutes. So we try and make bright, bold pictures, we try and have provocative headlines, we have shorter stories, we have Sudoku and we have comics because that's what people like out of our print product. Online, we know that people spend more time reading and they're more dedicated viewers. So we can have longer stories. But we also know that through social media, we get everyone depending on what's interesting. So we try and use it for all sorts of manners. We do it for 100 word stories on breaking things. We do it for longer features. And if a celebrity is on campus, yeah, we'll post a slideshow online because that's the expectations of what our readers want and because they know that this is their university. They want to see things happen to it. So in conclusion, when you think about what media is trying to do on a regular basis for you, they're generally trying to do three different things. They're trying to inform, they're trying to critique, but they're also trying to engage. And for a long time, that third part, that engagement part, sort of happened automatically. They didn't think about it, they assumed it was happening, and they just focused on the other two. But now it's the most important part of any organization. Because with so much out there, they have to engage with you directly, constantly, and they try and do it the best they can. They're learning, but they're going to continue to do it, and we're going to continue to do it one story of engineers blowing things up at a time.